<laughs> Salutations, and welcome to another installment of our Halo beta series. However, for today's entry, we won't be analyzing a beta, but an early alpha build of the first Halo Wars title. In this full analysis, we'll have a chance to witness the very foundations of the Halo Wars franchise being constructed. This alpha build in particular is important because it represents a transition from the content seen in the E3 2007 trailer for this game to what we'd eventually purchase as a final product nearly two years later in early 2009. This early build of Halo Wars was used for a private Xbox Live test in February of 2008, one year before the release date. Those who managed to view a Microsoft employee playing this build would see the description stating that they were playing Sway, which was the codename for this Halo Wars Alpha test. When hopping into the main menu, an older version of the main menu theme is being played, followed by radio chatter as background noise. I already have the piece uploaded to my channel, so if you'd like to give it a listen, the link will be in the description, as well as being on a card on the top right. A placeholder background is being used in the Alpha's main menu as well, showing a still picture of the Spirit of Fire with a planet that is most likely Harvest, and the animation of the planet rotating loops every couple of seconds. Despite the fact that this Alpha build doesn't contain any single player levels, the prototype campaign menu could still be accessed, and inside the selection shows options that it would typically be expected from a campaign menu, with the options for starting the campaign from the beginning, selecting a mission, or playing through co-op. Attempting to start the campaign will show a brief synopsis for the first mission of the game, but due to there being no campaign map files, it will be taken back to the main menu. Upon selecting the campaign menu again, a continue option will appear even though there has been no progress made to the campaign, along with a new option replacing start campaign. The final version of the campaign menu has more options than what is seen in the alpha, which is to be expected. Options for load game, tutorial, difficulty, and theater are not present in the alpha version of the game. Select mission is the only option in the alpha that functions properly, and when diving into it, there will be lists of the campaign missions using placeholder names, followed by their respective cutscenes that are actually using the same names as their final counterparts. This is interesting because the cutscenes were given their own distinct selection in the final game, away from the other missions. Next up is the skirmish menu, which is a section of the game that allows players to fight in a multiplayer setting against AI bots. Like in the final game, six total players could be in a single match. Unfortunately, there's no way to play this alpha with other people, so I was only able to play with the AI. The map selection offers one of each type of level, which is 1v1, 2v2, or 3v3, and all three of the maps included are using codenames. 1v1 Cross is Chasms, 2v2 Halo is Repository, and 3v3 Arabia is Frozen Valley. According to the record game selection in the alpha, a proper theater mode was going to be included in the retail version, but much like what happened with theater mode during Halo 2's development, it was scrapped sometime before release. It doesn't work in the alpha either, unfortunately. When selecting a specific player, the options are much like those that can be seen in the final game. Funny enough, I'm able to set my own difficulty. Unfortunately, only the UNSC leaders are usable in this alpha build, meaning no Covenant units are usable except for one, which I'll get into later. All three of the UNSC leaders that are playable in the retail version are usable in the alpha. Interestingly enough, only Forge is a unique unit, which is in this case the Cyclops, meaning Cutter's Elephant and Anders' Gremlin are absent in this build. Moving on down the main menu selections, clicking on Live will ask you to sign into a profile, which is how I got my local profile loaded up, replacing the Not Signed In text. Obviously, Xbox Live won't work. The Options menu is inaccessible. The Extras menu only has two choices. One is Playback, which is blank, and the other is Credits, which is also inaccessible. The Other menu has a few more notable selections. It's unknown as to what the Playback button was supposed to be for, but it looks like it was meant to view recorded games. Unfortunately, clicking on any of the provided options will crash the alpha. Clicking on Calibrate lets the player edit the gamma and contrast levels. Flash Viewer shows this, and this only. The Cinematic Viewer is inaccessible. Finally, the Model Viewer shows a massive catalog of various file names for the many aspects of the game. Despite the name of the selection being the Model Viewer, clicking on any link will do nothing, but there is still noteworthy information that can be gathered here. There are some file names that depict interesting concepts, such as a supposed Brute Tank, or the E3 2007 variation of the Scarab. It also seems as if the Mongoose planned to make an appearance in Halo Wars at one point. There's also a reference to the Gorgon, which was a cut anti-air vehicle unit that was cut sometime during Halo Wars' development. It would be replaced by the airborne vampire in the final game, and the Gorgon was most likely an inspiration for the Banished Faction's Reaver vehicle in Halo Wars 2. Now it's finally time to get into the main course of this video, which is the gameplay of the Halo Wars Alpha. Upon starting up a skirmish match, the loading screen looks vastly different to what we have in the final, and I actually kind of liked where this design was going. 
It shows off a generic map with four waypoints poking at various parts of its surface. The map image is used for all three maps in the alpha, unfortunately. Funny enough, this image depicts a map that isn't present in the alpha, nor does this image file go used in the final game either. This might represent an early version of the Tundra level, but I'm not sure. Before we get started in our gameplay analysis, I posted some raw gameplay of the alpha, without commentary, on the channel two weeks ago. If you'd like to watch that after this video, the link will be in the description as well as appear as a card on the top right. Upon booting up the level, the differences in the base design and HUD elements immediately make themselves known. The command center's design, followed by the green grid that surrounds the base, are leftover elements from the E3 2007 trailer for this game, and that's going to be a common theme going forward with this analysis. There are some details regarding the home base specifically that I have to mention. As you can see, there are areas around the base that have elements that appear to be missing, such as the ramp that comes out from the base and this side platform. In a minute, I'll explain why this is important. Coming across a new base site, a mock-up of the final game's UNSC base design can be seen. This means that the current command center design that we have in this alpha build is nothing more than a placeholder for what's to come later on in this game's development cycle. Selecting the base site to build a new command center reveals that it costs 900 supplies, while in the final game it only costs 500. This higher price to purchase a base will also start another trend throughout this video as nearly every unit, building, upgrade, and leader power in this build is more expensive than their final counterparts. The final game went with a much cheaper direction for pricing, so that matches would have a much faster pace than they do in this alpha build. The base building animation is quite humorous in how incomplete it is, with the building kind of looking like brown play-doh. Once the building is finished, those emptied areas around the base from before are now filled in with this new outpost, with the interior ramp looking more complete, and two air vents filling the other gap. Units spawn from a small circular pad in front of the base as opposed to the ramp as they're supposed to come out of, which they end up doing in retail. In the final version of Halo Wars 1, the command center's destruction is followed by the destruction of its attached buildings. When a command center is destroyed in the Alpha, however, the surrounding buildings actually stick around and continue to work. Supplies still regenerate, reactor power doesn't go away, and units from the barracks, vehicle depot, and air pad are still able to spawn despite the command center's absence. However, if a player has no more units in play and the last command center is destroyed, that player is eliminated from the game immediately, which still gives the Alpha command center a high degree of value. Speaking of a game's end, the ending screen has the foundations that would ultimately spawn what we have in the retail version, but it's quite different to its final counterpart. Nowhere in the alpha does it mention a scoring statistic for the players, and a building tab instead of a score tab exists in the alpha instead. Said buildings tab shows how many buildings a player has built and lost, and that statistic would be moved to the military tab in the final game when the building tab was removed. The building tab also mentions of captured nodes and built generators. Interestingly enough, Halo Wars 2 has power nodes that could be captured to increase the flow of power for your team, and also has generators that could be constructed at the base and do the same thing, but only gives power to the player who built them. In the final version of Halo Wars 1, some maps have garrisonable reactors, but they don't appear on all the levels like the power nodes do in the sequel. All of this may mean that at some point, reactor power is going to behave very similar to what we have now in Halo Wars 2, with it being a generating resource like the supplies are. And when the game was starting to shift to a more simplistic design during development, what we have left of that unused power model are the garrisonable reactors. The economy page shows how much reactor power a player received, the total number of supplies generated, and how many supplies they earned throughout supply crates found on the map. The two missing statistics that end up appearing in the final game are how many upgrades a player researched and the maximum amount of bases a player earned during the match. In the military tab, it tells us how many squads a player built and then lost, how many squads they killed, and how many buildings they raised, which means how many they destroyed. In retail, the statistics for squads built and lost are combined to form one section, and two new sections were added, with one saying how many buildings were built and lost by the player, and another that describes combat efficiency. In the alpha, supplies are automatically being generated despite the fact that no supply pads have been built on the outpost yet. The supply caches that litter the map use a design that is more akin to the UNSC than the blue foreigner crates that are used in retail. The icon used for picking up supplies isn't as helpful determining how many resources are currently being collected, especially when the home base is already generating resources on its own. This will be changed in the final game when it will be shown that exactly 10 supplies are gathered after a few seconds. The supply and reactor icons themselves are also reused from the E307 trailer. Inside the command center's circle menu, it's mostly the same as what we have in retail in terms of what's available, but the prices are much more expensive. 
Upgrading the base from Firebase to Station costs 1,200 supplies, compared to the much smaller price range of 300 supplies in the final game, and from Station to Fortress costs 1,500 supplies, as opposed to the 400 supply cost in retail. Warthogs cost 240 supplies as opposed to the final version's 150, while the upgrade to Gunner costs 1 reactor power and 600 supplies compared to the retail version's 250. Most of the units in the Alpha, besides the ones that turn to super units such as the Marines, Scorpions, and Hornets, only have basic upgrades that boost their attack and defense stats. This type of upgrade would transition to the final game, but instead of being its own upgrade, it's implemented as an additional layer to actual unit upgrades, such as the Wolverine's Volley or Scorpion's Canister Shell. In the Alpha, the Warthog is an exception to this, as its first upgrade will turn the Scout Hog into a Gunner Hog. The following upgrades for the Warthog in the Alpha are the aforementioned attack and defense boosts that all the other units get. The Grenadier and Gauss Cannon upgrades do not make an appearance in the Alpha version. Warthogs are also one of the three units in the Alpha that have a HUD element for a Y ability, which in this case is Ram. Unfortunately, Ram doesn't work with the Warthogs in this version of the game. There's also a terrible sound glitch that comes with the Gunner Warthog upgrade, so I advise all of you to lower the volume if you feel the sounds are way too loud. When the Warthog fires its turret, the sound effect stays there for the duration of the match, and it made me want to rip my own ears out. Due to this glitch, there will be moments in the video where I have no choice but to lower the in-game volume down so it doesn't blow out your eardrums and make you go about as insane as I did filming the series. Next in the Command Center Circle menu is the Cyclops, which is the only usably unique leader unit in the game. It costs 4 reactor power and 300 supplies, compared to the final version's 1 reactor power and 125 supply cost while its 1 Venerancy upgrade costs 5 reactor power and 1,000 supplies. The unit icon for the Cyclops is deceiving because it uses a different model compared to what is shown in the circle menu. When spawning one in, its appearance may seem recognizable for those who have played Halo Wars 2, as it uses a very similar design to the anti-vehicle Cyclops seen in that game. In the final version of Halo Wars 1, however, they use a different design altogether. The Cyclops and the Alpha are still anti-building units, but how they go about attacking other units is slightly different due to there being no drills on their arms like in retail. In practice, these units aren't all that worth using to be quite honest. There isn't much of a reason to build these units due to how slow they move across the battlefield without their high torque joint upgrade along with the absence of the adrenaline upgrade from the field armory, as well as the lack of the repair kit upgrade that heals vehicles and buildings. They also lack their Y ability that allows them to pick up debris and throw it. Finally, the one major difference in the Command Center Circle menu is the inclusion of the Spartans. In the final game, they're meant to be called into the barracks, but here the barracks aren't necessary. They cost 4 reactor energy and 900 supplies to produce one, with their Venerity upgrade costing 5 reactor energy and 1000 supplies. Spartans in this alpha build are quite different here. Instead of wielding SMGs, chain guns, and Spartan lasers through their upgrades, these Spartans only use assault rifles. They also lack shielding which fits in the Halo Cannon because the Mjolnir Mark IV armor didn't have an energy shield. Despite this, they were included in retail for gameplay purposes. Spartans in the Alpha also lack the ability to commandeer vehicles, which is one of the main traits that the Spartans are known for in Halo Wars. A small detail that I noticed with Spartans was how they used the animation for holding a chain gun when picking up supplies, which was interesting. It seems like the Spartans' chain gun implementation was swiftly approaching around the time this build was made, especially since it's mentioned in the description despite them actually using assault rifles in this build. The biggest and most notable difference for the Spartans in this alpha build is a feature that goes unused in the final game, but makes an appearance in Halo Wars 2. Spartans have the ability to inspire infantry units, which gives the Marine allies an attack and defense buff whenever they're in close proximity to the Spartans. In Halo Wars 2, this feature makes a return, where Spartan Jerome's leader unit has the same ability, only its effect extends to all units under his command as well as those used by allied players. Because the Spartans are spawned through the command center in the alpha, this means that only global rally points can be placed on the map, as base specific rally points aren't usable in the alpha. This also extends to the option of locking down the base, which is also notably absent. There are no leader specific powers in the alpha. While the MAC cannon is present in this build, Forge's carpet bomb and Anders' cryo bomb are absent. Also, the disruption bomb and pelican transport don't make appearances in this version either. I haven't seen the AI utilize any of the available leader powers, which are the MAC cannon, the regeneration field, and Cutter's ODST drop. The MAC Blast is insanely expensive compared to the final game price. In the Alpha, it costs a whopping 6 reactor power and 3000 supplies to call in, whereas the final version only costs 1 reactor power and 600 supplies. Also in retail, the MAC Cannon has an upgradable shock capacity, 
starting from having access to only one shot to upgrading all the way up to four shots. In the Alpha, however, due to the lack of a field armory, there's no way to upgrade it, and the Mac Cannon always has access to three shots right off the bat. The regeneration field costs 800 supplies to call in, while its final version only costs 350 supplies. Moving on to the buildings that can be constructed, all of the UNSC's buildings that appear in the final game, except for the field armory, can be utilized in the Alpha. When constructing a building, the animation is entirely different and resembles nothing of what we have in the final release. Instead of the building slowly rising up from underground like in the final game, a relatively complex animation will be played showing that the construction process is happening from orbit. When looking through the circle menu on another building slot, the progress on the building currently being constructed will be shown, and will continue to progress even when you call in another building. This applies to unit upgrades as well. Supply pads cost 100 resources like they do in retail, but there's a unique property to the supply pads in the Alpha when it comes to building more of them. Like reactors, building another supply pad will become more expensive than the last, with each consecutive supply pad costing 100 more resources. The model of the supply pad is obviously in a work in progress state along with the rest of the buildings in the game, but it works as intended nonetheless. The model for the Albatross, which is the UNSC airborne vehicle that drops off supplies in the supply pad, isn't finished yet and uses a placeholder model of the Pelican without its wings. To upgrade a supply pad costs an astounding 2 reactor energy and 500 supplies, way more than the 1 reactor energy and 225 supply cost in retail. Upon upgrading the supply pad, it gets its ceiling with a number 2 on it. Sergeant Forge's immediate access to upgraded supply pads isn't implemented in the game yet in this stage of development. In Halo Wars, when playing in a 2v2 or a 3v3 match, players are able to select their supply pad and send some of their funds to their teammates. The feature works in the Alpha, but selecting on the supply pad reveals another option, the ability to send energy. This feature is impossible to use because of the absurd energy cost of a staggering 800 that comes with it, which is the same number used to send an ally supplies. However, there is a reason for this being here. Going back to the E3 2007 demo, there's an instance where the demonstrator is viewing the circle menu for the vehicle depot, and not only do each vehicle have a supply cost, but the reactor energy cost is a lot higher than they should be. This is further and more concrete proof from an earlier point in this video that Halo Wars 1 was going to have an economy system for power much like Halo Wars 2's power model, with energy being a generating resource that shares many parallels to the supplies. Speaking of reactors, it's time to move on to them. Reactors are slightly more expensive in the Alpha, costing 50 more supplies to construct in the final game and cost 300 more supplies to build consecutive reactors. Unfortunately, the reactor doesn't have a building animation, and ordering one will automatically place the model onto the building slot, but it'll still need to take time to construct, quote unquote, until the reactor power is available. The reactor model is also slightly off-center for the building slot. Upgrading a reactor costs a whopping 2,400 supplies twice the amount that the final game's reactors ask for. Upon upgrading the reactor, the model will become much more complete, unlike the untextured model it had before. The barracks offers the same units as it does in retail minus the Spartans, which are the marines and the flamethrowers, which are called flame marines in the alpha. An odd feature regarding the barracks is that it starts off using a clay-like model, but when it takes a small amount of damage, a more detailed model is revealed. The barracks cost 400 supplies to build in the alpha, compared to the cost of 150 supplies in retail. Marines cost 240 supplies in the Alpha, as opposed to 100 supplies like in the final game. Marines in this Alpha build are absolute monsters, and they're the second unit in this build to have a Y ability. In this case, the Marines have a Y ability that goes unused in the final game. They're capable of sprinting across the battlefield at a high speed. Once they're done sprinting, they take a couple of seconds to recuperate and draw out their assault rifles. Just because the Marines don't have grenades as their Y ability, doesn't mean they lack any. Just like the rocket launcher marines in Halo Wars 2, they're able to throw grenades on their own, and they do so at a relatively fast succession and dish out a lot of damage, especially when the player has a sizable army of marines. These two unique aspects to the marines, sprinting and auto grenade throwing, would have made marine rushes hilariously overpowered, and I'm glad they eventually went with the final iteration of the marines in the first Halo Wars game. After three veterancy upgrades, with the first costing a single reactor power and 600 supplies, a second costing 3 reactor power and 800 supplies, and the last one costing 5 reactor power and 1000 supplies, Marines can then be upgraded to become ODSTs, with the upgrade costing 5 reactor power and 1200 supplies, and costing 300 supplies to call in a single squad. This increased cost for the super units is something unique to this build. In retail, 
super units cost the same as their unupgraded counterparts. ODSTs in the alpha are essentially enhanced marines. They dish out more damage and have more health, but they still wield assault rifles and throw grenades like their marine counterparts. They're also capable of being dropped from the Spirit of Fire much like how they can in the final game, but the rate of spawning them in through this method is a lot slower in the alpha. Flame marines have the same price as standard marines, costing 240 supplies in the alpha as opposed to 100 supplies like in the final game, and they only have access to veterancy upgrades with the first costing 1 reactor power and 600 supplies, the second costing 3 reactor power and 800 supplies, and the last costing 5 reactor power and 1000 supplies. They do not have access to the flashbang, napalm adherent, and oxide tank upgrades. In terms of gameplay, Flame Marines are basically the same as the Flamethrowers in the retail game, minus the aforementioned upgrades that are absent in this build. Next up is the Vehicle Depot, with the cost to construct one being 2 reactor power and 600 supplies, compared to 2 reactor power and 150 supplies in retail, and it offers the same 3 vehicles to call in as it does in the final game. Gameplay wise, the Scorpions are nearly identical to that of the final game, only missing out on the canister shell and the power turret. When upgraded to the Grizzly, they become the most broken units in the Alpha. Literally. They can't shoot. Their guns don't work. So upgrading the Grizzly is a serious ripoff. Grizzlies in the Alpha look radically different compared to their descendants in the finished product. Instead of being the stocky, twin-barreled version that made the Grizzly tank so iconic, the Alpha Grizzlies only have a single barrel and their bodies are more slender and elongated. Scorpions cost 2 reactor power and 1,200 supplies compared to the 500 supplies needed in retail, with the first upgrade costing 3 reactor power and 800 supplies, and the second upgrade costing 5 reactor power and 1,000 supplies. The Grizzly upgrade costs 5 reactor power and 1,200 supplies, as opposed to the 4 reactor power and 1,800 supplies cost in retail, and Grizzlies cost 1,440 supplies to build. Next up is the Cobra, and my goodness I have a lot to talk about regarding this thing. It has one of the more unique price changes in that it costs less reactor energy but more supplies to produce than in the final game. In the Alpha, the Cobra costs 2 reactor power and 840 supplies as opposed to the price of 3 reactor power and 350 supplies in the final game. The veterancy upgrade costs 3 reactor power and 800 supplies for the first one, and 5 reactor power and 1000 supplies for the last one. Cobras in the Alpha also take up 3 population points per vehicle compared to the final version, taking up only 2 points. Cobras are one of the few units in this build that look and perform quite differently to their retail counterparts. Instead of using technology centered around railguns, the Cobras in the Alpha are more traditional, shooting ballistic, explosive projectiles. They are much more damaging against infantry in this build of the game, making them quite overpowered as a vehicle unit. They are, from my experience, the preferred mainline vehicle of choice over the Scorpion tanks, thanks to being cheaper and more effective against everything in the game that is grounded. It still cannot attack air units, however, which is one of the benefits a Scorpion has over the Cobra, along with having more health. When deploying the Cobra, it looks more like a conventional artillery piece in the Alpha than the railgun design we have in retail. It shoots its rounds in a long arc, and it can reach great distances when deployed. In practice, a deployed Cobra behaves very similarly to the Plasma Rhinos in the Halo Wars 1 campaign, and the Kodiak artillery vehicles in Halo Wars 2. Up until now, the veterancy upgrades for most of the units in the game only change the attack and defense stats. However, the deployed Cobra's cannon shots have a unique visual property to them when the vehicle is being upgraded. When unlocking the first veterancy upgrade, the projectiles become green in color, and the second upgrade turns them into a red color. While the Cobra units are very powerful, they unfortunately have projectiles that take longer periods of time to reach their target, unlike the final game's Cobras having faster and more precise railgun shots. This means that these Cobras often miss their targets, especially when their targets are on the move. This is why, from my experience when playing in the Alpha, they're best off being used against slower targets such as larger vehicles, infantry units that can't move around that fast, and especially against buildings. Despite the inaccuracy, these explosive rounds have a small degree of splash damage that makes them devastatingly powerful against a group of enemies that are bunched up together. Like in the final game, Cobras are very effective building killers. In this clip here, I stationed a number of Cobras to shoot an enemy base from a higher platform on the alpha version of Repository. In this same spot in the final game, I attempted this, but was only able to have one Cobra fire at that base 
thanks to only one specific spot that granted that Cobra access to a viable sightline that catered to the way it fires. This might have been due to the changes in terrain from the Alpha to Retail, however. The last vehicle unit is the Wolverine. It costs 3 reactor power and 480 supplies in the Alpha, as opposed to 3 reactor power and 300 supplies in the final game. And its veterancy upgrade costs 3 reactor power and 800 supplies for the first one, and 5 reactor power and 1000 supplies for the last one. In this build, the Wolverines are nowhere near as dominating as they are in the final game. For one thing, they lack the volley ability that allowed them to shred through ground targets and buildings like a knife through butter, especially when you have a lot of them at your disposal. Instead of the secondary grenade launcher that the Wolverines now have in Halo Wars 1 and 2, they originally had two coaxial machine guns that fired on ground targets. They really don't do that much damage to anything, even when you have 15 of them attacking a base all at once, which is the maximum amount of Wolverines you can have in a game. This means they are much more specialized to the role of anti-air and not as versatile as their retail counterparts. For a comparison, they behave a lot like their Halo Wars 2 counterparts, who are also more dedicated to the role of anti-air only. Moving on from vehicles, next up is the air pad. In the Alpha, the air pad costs 3 reactor power and 600 supplies to construct, as opposed to the final game's price of 2 reactor power and 150 supplies. It offers the Hornet, the Vulture, and a third vehicle that technically goes unused in the final game, and we'll go over that air unit first. The Pelican was originally its own air unit instead of being a leader power. It costed 3 reactor power and 360 supplies to produce, and it only took up one population point. It's a passive air unit, having no weapons whatsoever and its only role was to transport ground units into battle. It can transport a combination of either 6 infantry squads, 1 vehicle and 4 infantry squads, or 2 vehicle squads. While I can imagine a lot of you are bummed out that the Pelican isn't a usable unit in the final version of Halo Wars 1, I can tell you from my experience playing the Alpha that such a change was good for the game because the Pelicans were simply another unit I had to micromanage during the heat of battle, and since they have no weapons, they can't do squat to support their teammates in combat. Next up is the Hornet. In the Alpha, it costs 3 reactor power and 600 supplies as opposed to the cost of 2 reactor power and 250 supplies like in the final game. The first veterancy upgrade costs 3 reactor power and 800 supplies, the second costs 5 reactor power and 1000 supplies, and the Hawk upgrade costs 5 reactor power and 1200 supplies compared to the final game, where it costs 4 reactor power and 1350 supplies when playing as Anders in multiplayer, and 4 reactor power and 1800 supplies when playing the final mission in the campaign. Upon upgrading to Hawks, these units cost 720 supplies to build. Both the Hornets and the Hawks are very finicky air units in the Alpha, as they have trouble with engaging moving targets due to them starting to spaz out when attempting to fight on their enemies. When stationary, they have a much better time acquiring their targets. Besides that annoying quirk, the Hornets function nearly the same way as they do in retail, while the Hawks use what appears to be placeholder projectiles from their machine guns, and they lack their nose-mounted Spartan laser cannons. The last UNSC air unit is the Vulture. In the Alpha, it costs a whopping 6 reactor energy and 2,160 supplies to call one in, while the final game only asks for 4 reactor power and 900 supplies. The Vulture has no upgrades to purchase in this build. The massive air unit uses a different design than its retail counterpart, much like the Cyclops, Grizzly, and the Cobra. It kind of looks like a giant, floating pickle in this version. In terms of gameplay, the Alpha Vultures are similar to their final versions, but not quite. In this build, they use their main auto cannons on everything, including air units, whereas in the final game, they use their secondary anti-air missiles against opposing air units, which are missing in the Alpha version of this game. The Vultures are the third and last unit in the Alpha with a functioning Y ability, which is their barrage. The missiles reach their target much faster and their grouping is a lot more precise. Except this one. Upon using the barrage, the player has to wait 30 seconds to use it again, and it actually tells you how many seconds you have to wait, whereas the final version of the game gives the player a circle-based timer. The dying animation of the Vulture is pretty hilarious too. The last buildings that we'll be talking about today are the base turrets. The building slots for them use the Covenant turret base slots as a placeholder, and each turret costs 620 supplies in the Alpha, as opposed to 250 supplies in the final game. They're designated as cannon turrets in this build, and their designs are a lot different here. The design, although a lot smaller in height, has a lot more going on here than their taller versions in the final game. They use the same base as the upgraded reactor, and they have four searchlights that surround the turret. Their damage output is pretty decent, but their turrets turn around very slowly and aren't as responsive as they would be later on in the development. Turret upgrades are much more simple in the Alpha, and lack the anti-infantry, anti-vehicle, and anti-air attachments that they'd eventually gain. In this build, 
They're supposed to simply buff their attack and defense like the veterancy upgrades do, but unfortunately, upon upgrading the turrets, they disappear from the base slot and no longer work. Not even upgrading them a second time would make a difference. Now that we went over units and buildings, it's time to move on to the three available maps and see just how different these alpha versions are to their retail counterparts. The foundations for all three levels are mostly there, and they wouldn't change that much over the course of the development of Halo Wars, but there are notable differences that can be spotted under minimal scrutiny. Once again, there are no rebel units or rebel bases on any of these maps. We'll start with 1v1 Cross, which is the prototype version of the map Chasms. The player's starting base is spawned where the respective rebel base would be located in the final game. There are no sniper towers on this map. Instead, they use a placeholder. Earlier in this video, I mentioned how there were no Covenant units in the Alpha except for one, and that one Covenant unit, quote unquote, are these grunt-occupied shade turrets that only exist on this one map. By themselves, they're neutral, reacting to absolutely nothing even when a unit walks close to one. However, when a Marine squad walks up to them and attempts to garrison the shade turret, the Marines spontaneously die, the population counter goes lower by one, and the shade turret changes color according to who garrisoned it. Now, the turret belongs to the player who sent the marines to it, and it's basically free map vision that doesn't take up your population count as you get refunded points for doing so. They'll even start to shoot at enemy units, but they have a limited field of vision meaning they can only shoot at what's in front of them. One more aspect of this map are the respawning supply crates where the forerunner supply elevator should be. In the final game, this area has the player send a marine squad to this elevator and when it's garrisoned, the supply income rate for that player will go faster. In the alpha, however, that's not in the level yet, so as a quick placeholder to it, there's a small piece of untextured geometry in that spot, and it respawns supply crates. I simply had a warthog sit there for the rest of the game picking up supplies for me as the game continued. Next up is 2v2 Halo, which is the prototype version of the map repository. The player's starting location is actually the same as it is in the final game, but the way the base was dropped on that location is slightly different. Its orientation is 90 degrees to the left compared to the direction the base faces in retail. Behind the two starting base locations, there are a bunch of supply crates. However, there's no base slot here, which is present in the final version of this map. There are some trees on the level that go untextured. The cliff edges on some of the more mountainous terrain are a lot more open, meaning it's easier for some units such as Cobras to engage opposing units and buildings from a higher elevation, whereas the retail version of the map isn't as forgiving with its level geometry. The biggest aspect of this level, however, is a sentinel factory in the middle of the map. It functions the same as it does in the final game, providing the player a variety of sentinels to utilize. However, there's a sentinel unit here that goes unused in retail. The recon drone costs 100 supplies and doesn't take up any population points. It uses the model of a Yen Mei, or the drone from Halos 2, 3, ODST, and Reach. With a model and a set of animations that look relatively complete, suggests that drones are at one point going to be a unit for the Covenant, but were cut during development. Regardless, the recon drone is a passive unit that flies around at high speeds. Its sole purpose was for reconnaissance, as its name suggests. Given that it only costs 100 supplies, doesn't take up any population slots, and is quite unnoticeable in this build, it would have made for a top tier scout unit in the final game. The closest thing that the final version of Halo Wars has to the recon drone are the protector sentinels that are featured on maps like Labyrinth, which are most likely what the recon drones eventually evolved into. Next up is the standard sentinel. It costs 1 reactor power and 250 supplies to produce, compared to the price of 1 reactor power and 100 supplies in retail. Gameplay wise, there really isn't anything different to them, but they do seem noticeably stronger in this build, melting through buildings when you have a significant number of them, whereas it takes a much longer time to destroy a single building with the same number of sentinels in the final game. This might have to do with how unresponsive the sentinels are in retail in comparison to their alpha counterparts, as I found that the sentinels in Halo Wars 1 don't always engage the unit to command them to attack right away. The last sentinel in the alpha is the super sentinel, it costs 4 reactor power and 1,000 supplies to produce compared to the price of 2 reactor power and 350 supplies in the final game, and takes up 4 population points in the alpha instead of only 2 in retail. Magneton over here uses a placeholder model of 4 sentinels stuck together. It behaves exactly like it does in the final game, acting as a support unit that slows down grounded units, but is unable to attack air units. It doesn't seem quite as effective in the alpha, as units are still capable of moving pretty quickly upon being hit by their beam attacks, unlike in the final game where the effective units start to move at a crawl and can no longer attack. The final playable level in the alpha is 3v3 Arabia, which is the prototype version of Frozen Valley. Out of the three maps in this build, this map has the least amount of noticeable differences. In the retail version of Frozen Valley, 
The center of the map has a Forerunner Spire of Healing, which heals units when they walk into it. In the Alpha, however, the center of the map has yet another untextured placeholder model, only this seems to give a damage buff to a single unit instead of health recovery. It'll only affect one unit at a time, and it'll switch to another unit at random intervals. This version of Frozen Valley also lacks the two garrisonable reactors, but interestingly enough, there's a circular Forerunner texture on these areas that the reactor should be in, suggesting that something was considered to be placed there later on in development. There are a couple of miscellaneous aspects within this build of Halo Wars that I'd like to mention. There are three differences that could be found within the Alpha's minimap. For starters, the map itself is positioned on the top left side of the screen, while it appears on the top right in the final game. A small feature regarding the base icons exists in this build, but goes unused in the finished product. The bases visible on the minimap actually display what base tier they are at by using military ranks. Fire bases start out as a private, stations are promoted to corporal, and fortresses become sergeants. It's odd as to why this got cut in the final game, as its impact on the game is borderline unnoticeable. Lastly, the pings looked and sounded like this. The pause menu is very bare bones, but it lists a feature that is pretty significant in my opinion. You can actually restart a match in this build without having to exit to the main menu. If you wanted to simply resign and go to the main menu, that's an option as well. The options menu has selections that are to be expected from an options menu. When starting a 1v1 game on a level designed for 2v2 or 3v3 play, the base slots for the vacant starting locations aren't there in the alpha, but do make themselves present in the finished product. You could also have a 3 vs 1, 4 vs 2, or 5 vs 1 match happen in this build, but it's impossible to create this in the final game. However, it partially returned in Halo Wars 2, where the most you could have is a 3v1 game. Movement for ground units is kind of finicky. Warthogs tend to fall out of bounds much more frequently in this build than they do in retail. Units claustrophobically bunch up, facing through each other in a large group. When told to move to a new location, they have a follow the leader mentality. One by one, they'll start a single file line as they move to their designated rally point, and it looks hilarious seeing units walk out of other units to get this done. The scorpions are derpy in this game. I've had times where one drove backwards, and another was driving upside down. Why? Why? There were instances in this video where there was sometimes a fog of war present on the map, and other times there wasn't one. The fog of war would appear for the very first game that was played upon booting up the alpha, and any consecutive game after that would cause the fog of war to disappear. However, the game pretends that there is a fog of war on the map, and enemy units would phase in and out of sight depending on how far away they are from the player's units. Earlier, I mentioned how the destruction of a command center didn't affect the surrounding buildings. In the Alpha, AI bots are capable of constructing bases next to buildings that are owned by another player, even if that player isn't on the same team. Finally, the voice lines for some of the units in the Alpha were left over from the E307 demo, as demonstrated here. Local military. Affirmative. Because we have to. While my coverage for the Alpha comes to a close, there are other outlets of Halo Wars cut content that I'd like to share with you. Going back to the E307 demo, we see grunt squads waiting outside of the UNSC base. The elites that command over the grunts use to change weapons depending on what they're engaging. If they're fighting infantry, they'll use plasma rifles. But if they're going up against vehicles such as these warthogs, they'll switch to the fuel rod gun, which is based off the model used in Halo Combat Evolved. The Scarab was also using a design that closely resembles its Halo 2 counterpart. However, a Super Scarab that uses a similar design can be seen being under construction in the retail version 7th campaign mission. There was an animation reel for Halo Wars made by animator Charles Tinney that shows off some more cut content. Grunts were at one point going to be able to use fuel rod guns, and they end up doing so in Halo Wars 2. The Jetpack Ranger elites from Halo 2 were also going to be a unit. Most surprising, however, was that the Arbiter was at one point going to be able to hijack vehicles. In this demonstration, he can be seen killing the driver of a scorpion, and then proceed to hop inside the cockpit. There's plenty of other unused animations, such as various assassinations. If you want to see the full video, I'll link it in the description. A second animation reel by Woody Smith depicts a cyclops showing off various idle animations and combat maneuvers. The biggest eye-opener here is that at one point, the cyclops was supposed to have execution animations against warthogs, and some of these look really sick in my opinion. The pictures shown in the back cover for Halo Wars are slightly misleading as they depict certain aspects that are not in the final game. The first picture shows off a scarab using its older Halo 2 design, followed by the Covenant using a more pinkish color scheme. 
The second picture shows off a skirmish match on the Labyrinth multiplayer level. I noticed one very slight difference besides the graphical changes. The sniper tower located in the picture is too far forward when comparing its location in the retail product. The tower was moved slightly back in the final release. The final picture shows off a battle on what looks like chasms. The obvious difference here is the use of the spirit dropship which goes unused in multiplayer. It probably would have functioned the same way the pelicans did in the alpha build, or it could have also been handled the same way the pelicans do now in the final game, where they can be called in. The funny part about this back cover was that it was reused for the Platinum Hits edition, which came out two years after the initial release of Halo Wars. To finally wrap up this video, I'd like to talk about a specific developer blog post called Five Long Years. In this article, Aloysius talks about the release candidate builds for Halo Wars. It is mentioned that release candidates 1 through 10 were used for fixing various bugs, and release candidate 11, specifically Halo Wars build number 1169, would be the version of the game to be sent to Microsoft for certification and to eventually go gold. It's entirely possible that some of the release candidate builds are still out there, much like this alpha build that I covered. And that's it for this very long episode of our Halo beta series. Tune in for the next episode of this series where I cover the Halo Reach beta. If, and only if, you enjoyed this video, hit the like button and subscribe for more Halo content on this channel. And make sure to follow me on Twitter and join my Discord server. I have also finally set up a Patreon page for this channel. If you'd like to voluntarily donate to me, you may feel free to follow the link in the description. For now, I'm not asking for anything more than one US dollar, but you can donate however much you'd like. Before we send this video off, I have to give a shout out to our first two Patreons, Storm from Storm and Blackbird, whose channel I'll also link in the description, and Mihir Gates who helps run our Discord server. Your donations are very much appreciated and words cannot describe how thankful I am. This is the Ventral Vatum, and I'll see you on the great journey.